you know, we have not spoken since last Friday when the big news was, of course, Blake Wheeler moving on from from captain. And I mean, that's been a big topic all week long. But now the team's on the ice. They're moving forward. Um, you know, we chatted a little bit over the last couple of days out at the rink. Um, what's just been your perspective on how different things have been sounded and looked from uh, from your eyes after all of these Paul Maurice training camps to um, a new feeling around this club and a very different look of training camp under Bones. Yeah, it's super interesting, Huss. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we talked about it last Friday after the decision was made. Uh, uh, what I've seen from Blake Wheeler so far is exactly what we talked about last Friday. I've seen effort and nothing different than normal. Uh, Blake's not the most vocal guy on the ice uh, when it comes to training camps. He's a guy who knows he's got to get his body ready. We know he comes in physical condition. His conditioning is at a great level. He just started, wants to get his timing down. Uh, obviously, too, we know, I, I would say this. I wrote about it on sportsit.ca. I mean, I think the players have shown the requisite level of respect for what Wheeler has done previously, uh, but also sort of giving you that indication that they were ready to take on a little bit more responsibility and the guy, obviously, that stands out the most in that department is Nikolai Ehlers to me, uh, you know, saying, I'm 26 years old. Basically, I haven't had a whole lot to say so far, but over the course of my time in the NHL, I have come to the conclusion that I do have some things to say, and it sounds like he won't be afraid to share them. Uh, not that he wasn't maybe sharing them as much in years past, but I expect him to be a little bit more vocal. But Ehlers is always an effort first guy, and I think the vocal or rah-rah part comes second. But we saw him develop and emerge as a leader with this group. I think he continues that progression. Uh, Adam Lowry is another guy we expect to probably wear a letter this year. Uh, he spoke about it today as well, saying the same things. He was among those who was surprised, shocked. But at the same time, I mean, he's just going to lead the way that he has previously. Uh, no one out there saying, hey, man, I'm the next captain, which is exactly what we thought. I mean, the next captain is going to emerge as the course of the year. Uh, rolls along, see what happens from there. I I've liked what I've seen, and Huss, you talked about it yesterday. What I've seen from the players is a group of engaged players who are having conversations, and they are asking questions about how the system is supposed to be run. We know it's aggressive, but where is my responsibility? What am I supposed to do in this scenario? What am I supposed to do in that scenario? Those are good things for the Winnipeg Jets because the players want to be in the right position and they're not going to be standing around like they might not know where they're supposed to go or why they're supposed to go there, which was a problem at times last year. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Ken. And, you know, let let me just say this um, and get your comments on it. Um, but just big picture. I mean, you mentioned the communication, the pace of what Rick Bonus is instilling in the club really stood out to me right off the bat um, yesterday. Um, what have you thought overall about, I mean, you obviously had to leave and missed half of it doing the show, but um, over the last couple days, just what have you thought about um, the way things have been done and what have you noticed about Rick Bonus and his interaction with players? Because, man, he's got a lot of energy and seems to be really engaged with, with everyone, regardless of veteran or young player trying to uh, you know work their way up in the organization. Yeah, Huss, it's just that uh, unbridled enthusiasm that you see from Rick Bonus. I mean, even joked about it yesterday. This is a guy who's stride at six. I, I hope that I can skate like Rick Bonus at 67 it's years old. It's uh, unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable. He's got great energy. He's got the flow going out there. Uh, but what you really see is the teaching and the tactician. I mean, uh, the preparation is something. I mean, everyone knows Rick Bonus is a good person and he's a good communicator. But this guy is prepared. He is laser focused. But like, I think that Rick Bonus would take the open door policy to a new level. Uh, I think this is a guy who wants you to roll into his office. I would use this example, Hus. Kirk Muller told me once when he was head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes, I have an open door policy. But the problem for young players is that they don't want to hear what I have to tell them. So the open door policy isn't always welcome. I think for Rick Bonus. He's the kind of guy that can tell you you made a mistake without embarrassing you, and he believes it's his responsibility to help you eliminate that mistake the second time. Rather than being scared what to ask or not want to make a mistake, he wants you to ask the question so that you're better prepared to make the right play on the ice. And if you make a mistake, he feels as much responsibility in himself and in his teaching 
rather than just laying the responsibility and burden on the player who may have made an error. So to me, that that's one thing that's really stood out. Uh, we knew he was going to be engaging when it came to his media sessions, but man, does he get involved on the ice with the players? And you can tell the players are responding to him because of what they're learning and what they, you know, this is like a pop quiz where the players have a lot of questions for the coach. How the coach handles those questions can determine the level of buy-in that is required. And to me, I'm seeing the Jets ask a lot of questions, but I'm seeing Rick Bonus. He's he's studied for the test, and he has the answers to any question that is being tossed his way. Ken Weave with us from Sportsnet on Winnipeg Sports Talk, live from Winnipeg Jets training camp. Ken, Rick spoke yesterday, and I'm sure today as well, uh, about the systems that he's instilling, how this team will play different under his guidance. Um, you're always a good guy to talk X's and O's having played as long as you have. I mean, how, when we drop the puck on the regular season, how different do you think, how will things look differently from watching the game? And are there any key players that you think on this roster stand to benefit the most from the stylistic change that he's trying to instill in the club. Yeah, it's super interesting. Us people think naturally when it comes to Rick bonus, that it's only a defensive style. That, that's not the case. This is a team that is going to be very disruptive in terms of their back pressure, their back checking and being aggressive. That doesn't mean five guys go blowing the zone and cheating on the offensive side of the puck. If your defensemen are going to be aggressive at both blue lines, which we expect them to be, that means the high forward, the F3, is going to have to be responsible enough to backfill into that kind of a position. What I think a lot of people liked, Huss, about the conversation with Rick Bonus yesterday is that he wants them to be much more aggressive when it comes to disrupting zone entries. The Jets were much too passive in terms of allowing their opponent to enter the zone with speed, with numbers, and they really struggled in that area. And Rick Bonus, you know, for everyone who thinks Rick Bonus is just some, you know, uh, veteran or experienced guy who hasn't adapted to the times, well, Rick Bonus dropping a 31st in zone entry disruptions, I'm sure that was something that was pretty welcome to the analytical uh, eyes and ears in the organization. And he was flat out, he flat out said, we need more from the defense in terms of offense. 24 goals is a number he referenced on numerous occasions. This team needs to be more offensive, but it has to find that risk-reward balance. So what I would say to this, us obviously the personnel is much different than 2018. I think the Jets are going to play a much more similar style in terms of being aggressive all over the ice, which is something that we saw in that 2017, 18, 18, 19 seasons uh, when you had a, a much you know a mobile blue line. You know, what does that mean for Declan Chisholm, Billy Hanela? I mean, that's got to be music to the ears of those players, but it also means they're going to have to show that they can take care of the defensive side of the puck as well. Um, so I think it's going to be fascinating. The word competition and opportunity was being dropped uh, quite frequently yesterday by both Rick Bonus and Kevin Sheveldayoff. And again, you reference the young players. That is music to the ears of young players and not just on defense, us. I saw David Gustin walk down the hallway here at the end of the second session today. He is eager. The Gus bus is revved up and ready to roll. He feels like there's a big opportunity for him. And let's not kid ourselves. It's no accident that Sam Gagne is being placed alongside David Gustafson and also that Dominic Toninato is playing on the left wing on that line and not at center. Again, a lot can happen over three weeks and six preseason games. But if you're David Gustafson and you came into camp last year, Huss, playing on the sixth line at center and not playing with NHL caliber line mates, you got to be feeling good about your opportunity. Now it's about seizing that opportunity. And then on the back end, boy, oh boy, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake down. I like, I like the way they have the defense pairing set up, Huss. But the problem for us is that we were trying to check out the old clues in terms of who is going to be with whom. Right now, I don't think there's a lot of clues being given other than, you know, other than maybe uh, Schmidt and Sandberg. Could that be a pairing? Yes. Could Hanel and Dylan be a pairing with Hanel on the right side? Yes. But I'm not sure, like, these are not the pairings you would expect to stick throughout the camp. They're probably pairings you're going to see in some of the preseason games, and that's going to sort out some of the competition when it comes through five, six, seven, eight, nine, and beyond. 
because we know there is still a surplus on the back end. Well, there is. And I just wanted to get to that because, I mean, they certainly are saying that, you know, all the things that I think people want to hear opportunity for young players. We want to see and give them a chance to spread their wings. Um, I guess just as presently constructed. I mean, how does that happen? And, and I guess let me ask you this, Ken. What if Billy Hanel and Dylan Sandberg are just absolute standouts through this entire camp? And Rick Bonus feels, hey, these guys, these guys are in my top six. I want these guys playing. How do they manage that? Well, they're going to manage that the way that Rick Bonus told us today. Huss. I'm not sure if you heard the clip yet. Rick Bonus said players will cut themselves. You know, that's the flip side of the coin when it comes to opportunity. There will be opportunity to, for you to show that you deserve to be on the team. But it also means that you'll be given chances to show that maybe you're not ready. And that doesn't just apply to the young players you referenced us. Uh, that applies to all players. Uh, what we know is that the previous hierarchy is no longer uh, in, in place, that there will be opportunities provided to players on this roster, whether you're a young player or a veteran player. But it's going to come down to who plays best. And if those two play best, Huss, I mean, I know we debated who's in the top six. I still have Hanel and Sanford in my top six. But if that's the case, that's either going to cause an uncomfortable waiver situation or a trade before we get to October 14th. And the biggest thing to me also, Huss, about yesterday was Sheffield Bayhouse comments. And I know you heard me. He tossed up open for business sign. That's what I read in the reading between the lines. Uh, he said he referenced other teams having injuries or guys out of camp. To me, that was that was the sound of, yes, I have confidence in what we have, but I'm trying to make this team better. And he knows where he can make the team better. It's up front, and it's by moving some of those other defensemen on the back end. So it's interesting. You want players to feel comfortable, but there also needs to be a bit of uneasiness because if you're not going to play better than the young players trying to push for a job, you're not going to have the job. So uh, to me, that's what we'll be watching. Once the games get rolling, once we see it against NHL competition, I know people were going wild on the old socials yesterday. Brad Lambert dangling and scoring a nice goal. Like, great job by Brad Lambert. Scoring an impressive goal in a drill uh, on day one of training camp is not getting you on the team or getting you a chance uh, to get a look on the top six in a preseason game. And this is not a knock on Brad Lambert by any stretch. And by the way, Huss, Brad Lambert did not participate today. It's a minor upper body injury. According to Rick Bonus. he thought he would be back on the ice uh, on Saturday, but he was not a participant today. Uh, so there was no oohs and ahs when it came to Brad Lambert in the scrimmage today. Uh, but having said that, I, I still feel as though there's an opportunity for the Jets to make a move. And not just make a move, I feel like a move is ne necessary because of the construction of the roster and because of what they're trying to accomplish. But the thing has to, where we've been trying to speculate who, who fits best or who gets the most return, that's what these six games are all about. It's about finding out who could benefit the most by playing this aggressive style. And I know you asked me that question about 10 minutes ago during my trip to the buffet. I think an aggressive style helps guys like Nate Schmidt and Brendan Dillon, uh, Neil Pionk even, and I think Josh Morrissey will welcome that. But I also think it, it, it benefits a guy like Dilly Hainala. I spoke with Hainala along with Jeff Hamilton uh, today, and I asked him specifically if he felt that that aggressive nature would play to his strengths, and he feels as though it will. So. Uh, I mean, we know the comparisons have happened, and Billy brought the comparison on himself when he compared himself to Miro Haskinen when he was drafted. Now, again, this is a pump the brake situation. Miro Haskinen is already an elite defender. Billy Hanela is not at that level yet. Billy Hanela is not the size of Miro Haskinen. He's not the, he does not have the skating ability, but he has a lot of similar qualities. So I could see Rick looking at Hanela and saying, you know, even if you get a, a guy who's 70% of Miro Haskin, and you've still got a darn good NHL defenseman in there. And Billy's just getting started, Huss, right? That's the thing. He's still 21 years old, and his best days are ahead of them. And it's interesting. In some ways, Billy is a victim of his own success. Because he made the team unexpectedly as an 18-year-old, he probably feels like it's taking forever to get an NHL spot, even though he's only 21 years old. So 
there's a bit of a paradox going there for him. But I see a lot of maturity from Billy Hanala. He didn't have the best scrimmage. He had a really nice play, and then he had a bad turnover, I think, that led to one of the goals. But this is a guy who cannot play a tentative game. He has to play an assertive style of game, needs to be aggressive, and that's why this new system, I think, will suit Billy Hanala well. But even Rick Bonus said today when I was asking about Hanala, Hanala has to show you that you can win with him in the lineup. So to me, I think there's um, a lot of pressure on a guy like Billy Hanala to win the job. I think he has the ability to win the job, but he's going to have to beat somebody out on the roster who is currently ahead of him on in the pecking order, even though the depth chart is sort of starting at ground zero. Uh, if Billy's able to play his way onto the team, uh, from your perspective, Ken, who's the best defense partner for a young player like that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, last week I would have told you Dylan DeMello because I expected Hanela to be on the left side, even though there is the biggest log jam on the left side. Now that I've seen it with Brendan Dillon for a couple of days, and I've listened to both Brendan Dillon and Billy Hanela talk about the other guy, I mean, we all remember, Huss, the great podium visit last year where Nate Schmidt was professing about Billy Hanela and the, you know, about how he went through the things in Washington where they traded for a guy at the deadline two years in a row, right when he thought he was had established himself as an NHL regular. So I do think that Brennan Dillon is a great fit beside Billy Hanela because of his big, strong physical nature. And Brennan Dillon is still mobile as well. So I think there'd be a good pairing there that you could see during the course of the regular season, depending on how things shake out. But it's going to depend a lot on how the other guys fare. I love the fact that Dylan DeMello is skating alongside Declan Chisholm. And Huss, we're all talking about Hanela, and rightfully so. But to me, the guy that's taken the biggest strides on the back end in the last two years is Declan Chisholm. I mean, another, you know, I think it was Jack Hahn this week. He's comparing Declan Chisholm to potentially growing into a guy like Devon Taves. And Huss, having watched the Colorado Avalanche in person during the conference <laughs> final and the Stanley Cup final, if Declan Chisholm can get to somewhere close to the level of Devon Taves, the Jets are going to be awfully thrilled with that fifth-round pick that they made. But again, it just complicates the situation. Again, I'm not here saying that Declan Chisholm should be on the opening day roster, but well, he will also benefit from this style, Huss, based on his strengths as a player and his fluidity as a skater, and he's a guy who has made some great strides on the defensive side of his game as well. All I'm yeah. saying is that he may, he is another legitimate option, even though we all kind of went into camp thinking he's probably another year away, but we thought that last year, and when he went in in that small sample size, was able to deliver. Well, just on Chisholm, and I got to give a, a stick tap to Avco Cup, who's a, a great follow for, uh, for Jet Stuff on Twitter, follows the team very closely and has some great takes. He said yesterday, and I totally agree with this, not only would we like to see what Billy Hanela can do and Dylan Sandberg can do as regulars in an NHL lineup on a blue line, but I think if those players are with the big club, it also allows Declan Chisholm to take an even bigger, more expanded, more responsible role with the Manitoba Moose. And I think if if he's going to fulfill that potential that you just talked about with Jack Hand, um, that is a big part of the path to get to that point as well. And, you know, as much as we can talk about the blue line being loaded up here in Winnipeg right now and some tough decisions, it's the exact same thing for Mark Morrison if those guys aren't on the roster and are back with the Manitoba Moose. Yeah, no doubt about that, Huss. And I do, this is why I'm saying, I, like, I think that Chisholm has worked himself into the equation, but I'm with you. I think Declan Chisholm is better served by playing 22 to 24 minutes as the number one guy with the Manitoba Moose, at least to start the year and then sort of see what happens. And just quickly, when it comes to the depth, I mean, Ashton Sautner is clearly a depth guy, uh, but he has a little bit of a physical edge that the Jets don't have a whole lot of. So you saw he was one of those guys playing a physical role during the scrimmage today. And Kyle uh, Cap Capobianco is also a guy who's pretty mobile. So, I mean, there are going to be some good veterans for Chisholm to be paired with on that number one pairing when it comes to the Manitoba Moose as well. But boy, oh boy, I mean, we wanted there to be an open competition, Huss. There is clearly one, and there are a lot of people in the discussion. I mean, this 
this has come, become a strength for the Winnipeg Jets on the back end. And I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have been having that same conversation, you know, two or three years ago when the uh, defense corps had an overwhelming change uh, to the grouping. You got it. All right, Kenny, this has been awesome. Hey, before we go, and folks, after we talk to Hacksaw, we will have some of these clips uh, with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Rennie earlier today, and I'm not sure whether you were there at the same time or this was a one-on-one -on -one where he was talking to Pierre-Luc Dubois, who you know, was very excited about the season and said everything's on the table for Winnipeg, um, you know, for whatever's going on and kind to, you know, quell anything that happened in the offseason, courtesy of Pat Brisson. Um, but I just am interested in your perspective on Dubois, what you've seen and heard from him so far, and, you know, his spot on a one-year deal with two years under team control being such an important asset for the Winnipeg Jets and one that they would love to maybe change the tone of the summer and, have him maybe a little more interested in sticking around long term. Yeah, this was the first time uh, Pierre Luc Dubois spoke uh, to the mass media uh, this morning. Uh, same kind of thing. I mean, Pierre Luc Dubois loves hockey, and I've, I've written about this uh, several times. Pierre Luc Dubois is great at compartmentalizing. He doesn't care about what happened in the summertime. He's only focused on having the best season possible. So, to me, I think he's in a great headspace. Uh, he's in fit, he's physically fit as always. We know sometimes you forget how strong he is. There was a drill how, during the scrimmage basically got into a battle with someone and threw him to the ice. I mean, but this is a guy who wants to expand, you know, spread his wings on the offensive side. I do think it's interesting that he's starting the camp with Cole Perfetti and Blake Wheeler based on the chemistry we saw with Kyle Connor last year. But I think that's more about having a dynamic and electrifying top line potentially with Nikolai Ehlers and Mark Scheifele. And then you have the two big and strong guys in Wheeler and Dubois with Perfetti who has that great vision and, and the word processor that works uh, overtime in terms of his ability to see the game and think the game. So I think Dubois is in a good place. I expect him to have a strong season. And hey, I'm the one who said I expect Dubois to sign long term. So uh, if what he's saying uh, to Sean in that one-on-one uh, -on -one in production day turns out to be accurate, uh, I'll be asking Remo to play the clip from you know, 16 months ago when I was making the proclamation that he would be sticking around long term. So uh, I think he's in a good place. Uh, I know you're on to the football talk, but just two quick ones for me. Uh, we talked about him before, Hus. Saku Menelainen is a guy who I wondered how he would fare in the camp after being over in, you know, playing the KHL for two years, then playing in the Liga. He's my sleeper to watch in the exhibition games early. Uh, this is a big, strong guy. He brings a couple of elements to the table the Jets don't have an abundance of in their bottom six, specifically in their fourth line. So left shot that can play the offside. Looks like he's got a pretty good shot. He's got some mobility. Showed a little bit of edge so far. Uh, I'll be watching him closely uh, in the preseason. And also Kevin Stenland is a guy who's caught my attention early in camp. And not yeah, because just... he's a dead ringer for Blake <laughs> Wheeler. But the other thing we've seen, Hus, he's really clicked well with Mikey Asimont. Uh, those guys could be really, uh, you know, potentially impressive together uh, with the Manitoba Moose most likely. But Stenland's a guy that I want to see because, again, big, strong center, six foot four kind of guy. I think he had a knee injury last year that maybe uh, impacted his skating a little bit, but a uh, very smart two way guy. Those are two guys that I'll have my eyes on in the sort of uh, battle on the periphery. But boy, oh boy, can't wait to see some of those young defensemen in games. Uh, I know, too, Huss, you were there. What did you think of Menelainen? Oh, I, I, I already talked about it at the beginning of the show. He was a guy that really sort of stood out to me. Um, and it was also interesting. I mean, it was a great example of the coaching of Rick Bonus. I mean, he was one on one with Menelainen on a couple of occasions. One, I think, talking about what they were doing, uh, but then also talking about some of his technique in the corners after a battle drill. Um, yeah, intriguing prospect, a guy that I hadn't seen or known much about and, you know, definitely did kind of stand out today amongst the group. Um, Weber, have a great one tonight, and uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you tomorrow down at the rink. And uh, it's great seeing you guys. Great to be back. Great talking about some actually things happening right now this season as opposed to rehashing everything from last year like we did all summer. Yeah, Husker, always great to be with you. Have a great weekend and one last one. I know last week I dropped the Axel Bloomquist reference on you. Today, yes. Menelainen could be the Thomas Raffle of this training camp. Remember the brother of Michael, the Austrian sensation who had the strong camp, but then unfortunately I think got hurt in like his first or second game with the Moose and never got on track. You remember, uh, didn't he wear number five? 
I think it is possible that he did yeah. wear a low number. We thought yeah, he should yeah. be a defenseman. <laughs> Anyways, I think that Menelainen is a guy that's going to get games with the Jets this year. Uh, you know, again, he's got to win a job first and foremost. But I could see Menelainen uh, you know, doing a nice job. But he is hoping for better health than Thomas Raffle, that's for sure. 